last Sunday was Pentecost Sunday. And I shared with you about Pentecost last Sunday. And the Holy Ghost moved in a powerful, powerful way last Sunday. We had many people receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And I'm still celebrating that, still celebrating what the Lord did. This week was our state camp meeting. So it's a gathering of uh, pastors and, and uh, people from churches all over our state in Columbus. So that started last Sunday night. And then uh, Sunday night service, uh, Monday night, Tuesday night, and on Tuesday night, our general overseer of the denomination, Tim Hill, came to preach to us Tuesday night. He stood up on Tuesday night, and the Holy Spirit was moving in the room. And I, you know, you ever, you can tell when you see someone who's walking up and the Holy Spirit's moving and he had a, he was ready to preach. And he said, the Holy Ghost is not done with what he's doing. And he just quoted from Acts chapter 11 about how the Holy Ghost fell on them just as he did on us at first. And he said, this is a strange thing. The Holy Spirit spoke to me, but there are some pastors here that God wants to rebaptize you in the Holy Ghost, give you a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost if you'll come down here. And all of a sudden, you know, a pastor came and another pastor and another, you know, pastors, uh, couples with their wives. And all of a sudden, man, we just had a Holy Ghost altar call. And man, we just prayed the Holy Ghost broke loose all over that place. And uh, he never even got to preach. My goodness, what an incredible, incredible move of the Holy Ghost. And uh, so I want you to continue to pray because here's what, as I've been, as I've been praying now, if you've got filled with the Holy Ghost last week, and I know there's at least five people that I know of personally that got filled with the Holy Ghost. Maybe there's more, but at least five that have testified and told me they got filled with the Holy Ghost. Isn't that awesome? If you got filled with the Holy Ghost, you need to keep the flow going. Don't just, okay, I got it, now I'm good. No, that's not, the, that's not the goal here. It's we want the flow of the anointing of the Holy Spirit operating continually in our lives. You need to continue to press in for more. Somebody say amen. amen. And those of you that maybe came to the altar seeking the baptism, and last Sunday you did not have the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues, I've been praying for you all week. I prayed for you when I drove out of the parking lot and drove home last week, got home, and I told Jessica, I said, boy, I'm really burdened for people who were seeking, but maybe for whatever reason that they didn't have that answer on just on that day. And I've been praying all week for you. And I'm here to tell you, don't stop seeking him. When the altar call is given, you run to the altar. You come up to the altar. If you've got to come, you know, I, don't, I know how it was because when I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I was in the altar every single service. I'd come Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, any time. I would, I would just I'd ask people to pray for me. We had a prayer meeting, and I'd say, pray that I'll get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You need to keep on seeking Him. Don't get discouraged. Amen? And in praying for you and praying about this this week, here's what the Holy Spirit spoke to me. Sometimes we think about what happened last Sunday. Wow, wasn't that service good? But this outpouring is not an event. It's a season. It's a season of outpouring over this church. I don't know what's going on in every other church. I'm not in all the other churches. I'm telling you, God's saying this over Conneaut Church of God. It's not an event. It's a season. It's a season of Holy Ghost outpouring. And I believe it's a last day's season where the Holy Spirit is pouring out on all flesh to prepare us for the mission that we have to preach the gospel to everyone we can, that we could just grab people just before he comes in the clouds, that we could get them ready and prepared and take them with us when he comes for his church. That's what I'm, I'm believing this morning. 
I've asked the Lord this morning, God, fill people with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues in the altar this morning. If you haven't been praying that, intercessors, pray right now while your pastor's preaching. You come into agreement. And when the altar's given, I need Holy Ghost-filled intercessors to be up here praying with people this morning. Somebody say amen. amen. You keep hungering and thirsting. You remember what Jesus said in John chapter 7? He said, if anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And then John, I love how John writes because he gives little, it's almost like little parenthesis to explain things. And he said, but this he spoke of the Holy Spirit who had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. But that was to come after. That was to come after on the day of Pentecost. There'll be these rivers of living water. Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. If, 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 you're, if you're just so, I'm desperate and I'm running after you. And here's a scripture I want to speak to you just really quickly. I want to give this over you and you can pray over this. Here's what Matthew 5, 6 says. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be filled. If you're seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you just keep hungering and thirsting after the righteous one. That's Jesus. You just keep, Lord, I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more. I want more of you, just as they were singing a few minutes ago. And you shall be filled. Somebody say, shall be. Shall be filled. So I've been sharing with you on this subject, poured out. We've been walking through this theme in Scripture of being poured out in many different ways, and, and, and there's a whole lot of different uh, words used throughout Scripture, but here's what I've told you every Sunday, and you're going to see it again today, maybe even in a way you haven't ever seen it before. Pouring out symbolizes release. Pouring out symbolizes the release of something that was contained. It was held in some sort of a container, but the top was taken off and now it's poured out. And when it's poured out, it can be used for the fullness of the purpose that it had been intended for all along. So let me ask you, what is there that you feel like in your life has been held back that needs to be released. What is there spiritually in your life that there's maybe been a holding back or there's, a, there's been like a container on that needs to just be released? Because I believe God's pouring out in so many different ways. I believe there's an anointing of the Holy Spirit that he's pouring out on us. And today we're going to look at an Old Testament account about pouring out. There were a couple of prophets back in Kings that sometimes it's difficult to determine which was which they were, because their names were so similar. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, and then he had this young guy that he was pouring into, and he was Elisha. And Elisha had one request. What was that? I want to be a double portion guy. He said, I've seen everything that God did in you. I want more than that. I don't just want a little bit more. I don't just want partially more. I want double. I'm believing God for double. And Elisha was this double portion prophet of the Old Testament. He had the, the, the Spirit of God moving in his life. And he was dealing with the widow of, a, of another prophet that had been with him. He had served Elisha. And he had died. And now Elisha's coming to his widow. And if you have your Bibles, look in 2 Kings Chapter 4, 2 Kings, if you're looking for it in your Bible, it's conveniently located right after 1 Kings. 2 Kings 
chapter 4. And verse 1 says, One day the widow of a member of the group of prophets came to Elisha and cried out. Here's what her words were to him. My husband who served you is dead. And you know how he feared the Lord. But now a creditor has come. They always find you, don't they? A creditor has come threatening to take my two sons as slaves. My husband died, and he died in debt. And the creditor that he owed money to has now come and saying, he's going to take my sons away, and he's going to make them slaves to pay off the debt. Now, the first thing I want to tell you is some people settle for just enough. And I don't know what her husband's, you know, we don't know any details about him and why he had this debt. But I know some people, and I don't know if it was the case in this guy, because it could, have, this, it could have been unforeseen circumstances. It could have been natural disaster. There had been famine in the land previously. It could have been bad financial decisions. It could have been that he just um, got into debt and thought, well, I'll just pay a little bit and a little bit and a little bit, and he never could pay the debt off. Now, if you haven't learned, you need to learn that the credit card companies are not your friend. When we went through Financial Peace University, we decided we're going to cut up all of our credit cards. We're going to get rid of all of them. We we, we don't want to live a lifestyle of having any debt. We want to get rid of debt. So when we did that, I'm calling all the credit card companies. And the one that was very challenging was Discover. When I called Discover and I said, you know, talked, I got somebody, I want to cancel. Oh, why do you want to cancel? Well, I could offer you a, a really good interest rate. I said, I'm not inter- interested in, in the interest rate. I just want to cancel. Well, I could, I could increase your credit line, sir. I said, well, I don't want to do that. I just want to cancel. And they said, well, we could give you an offer of more cash back. I said, I don't want more cash back. I just want to cancel. Now, the operator that I was talking to could do anything, but they couldn't cancel. (laughs) And she said to me, well, if you want to cancel, you're going to have to talk to a relationship specialist. I didn't even know we had a relationship But the Discover people were in a deep relationship with me, and now we had to go to counseling. (laughs) So now I'm talking to the relationship specialist, and it was like talking to a counselor. The relationship specialist, well, I am so sorry. We've had a relationship with you, and he knew the date that I initially signed up with Discover. And he was like reminiscing, going back to all these wonderful years we've had together. We've, every month, we send you these wonderful letters in the mail, and you send us money. It's been a great relationship. Why do you want to break up? And it took a lot. I mean, I felt like I, it was like, man, my long lost love, and I'm just cutting them off over here because I'm breaking my relationship with the creditor. I don't know what this guy's relationship was with the creditor, but I know some people live on just enough. They don't think about the cost of what they're buying, they think about how much is it a month. And I could pay it every month for the rest of my life. But then they don't realize that their life may not last as long as they think it lasts. And maybe that's where this guy was. Maybe he was just, he didn't have margin in his life. He had too much debt and he was over leveraged. I'm not sure what the situation. But when he died, the debt passed on to his family. 
And now his wife, and even worse, his sons, are being threatened by the creditor because of whatever had happened before in being in debt. Now, some people live that way in the natural. But even worse, some people live that way spiritually. They live on a just enough mentality, just getting by. Their relationship with God is just enough. Their relationship in the church is just, they're just connected enough. There are some people who have, they feel like it's a good relationship with the church, but they're not really part of the church. They're not in ministry in the church. Can I tell you that if you are saved, you need to be in church. If you're watching me and you're not here and you're in another church, you need to be plugged in in that church. You need to be in a local church and you need to be serving God's church. It's God's will for you to be active and involved in serving others in the body of Christ. Some people are just way too casual, casual in their relationship with God, casual in their prayer life, casual in reading of the word, casual in ministry, casual in the relationship with the church. They're here and then they're not. And other things take higher priority. And you know, when everything's going good, you can live that way and feel fine. But when you hit a bump in the road, when trouble comes, when difficult times come, then people run to the church. It's a shame, but there are some people that I know if I get a phone call from them, I know there's trouble because I don't hear or see anything from them for months and months. And then the phone rings, and I'm like, oh, they must have, there must be trouble because that's the only time that they're, they're involved in the church. Can I encourage you? You need to get more and more and more involved with him. You need to be more and more and more in prayer, more and more and more in the word, more and more and more in the church. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but even so much more as you can see the day is approaching of his swift return. Is that good? I don't know about you. I don't want a just enough mentality. I don't want God, I don't want to say, well, God, I'm just going to limit you to this area. Some people have the little dabble do you mentality, right? I just give this little bit. I want enough. They want to be in church. It's all good. But I don't, I mean, I don't want to go crazy with it now. Now, let me just encourage you go all in. Just go all in with the Lord. We used to sing this song, and it's an okay song. We used to sing, here's my cup, Lord. Right? I lift it up. Just fill it up. It's an okay song, and I understand the meaning of the song, but I'm not, I'm not asking God to just fill my cup. What a selfish prayer. God, just give me enough so that I can get by. I don't want anything extra. That is not God's will for you. It is God's will for you that he pours so much into you that it overflows out in every direction. I don't want to just have my little cup and have a little, I just don't want to have a little, little, little sip of tea. No, no, no. I want to be overflowing all the time. I want there to be a constant flow that comes out of me. I want to be poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out and poured out for the Lord. See, the sad thing is, if you live a just enough lifestyle, it'll affect your kids. Apparently, there was a just enough mindset financially, and now this woman is saying, now they're coming after my kids. You live a just enough lifestyle spiritually, rest assured, the devil's coming for your kids. When you just kind of, you're in church, out of church, your kids don't know. We go into church on Sunday. If your kids ask you if you're going to church on Sunday, mom and dad, you're not doing it right. They ought to get up and know, yeah, that's our priority. They, you ought to be praying together as a home, as a family. You ought to be in the word. You ought to be, they ought to know that they know that they are in a Christian household. 
the enemy wants to take your kids and put them in slavery. And note that when the creditor was coming, it wasn't because of anything that the sons had done. It was passed down to them. Be, be very, very aware, mom and dad, that your sons and daughters are watching And that they may have to be the ones that pay for the decisions that you've made. When I was youth pastor, I had parents who had raised their children outside the church. Parents weren't in church. The, the students were in church. Now they've raised them for 15, 16 years out in the world. And, the, and now the, their students are getting in trouble. And then they bring them to me on, and bring them in for a Wednesday night. Like, here, I'm going to drop them off on Wednesday. You fix them. We need to make sure that we're not loose in our relationship with the Lord or with the church, with prayer or with the word. That's good right there. All right, that's not really what I'm preaching, but I just I threw that one in. Then look at verse 2. What can I do to help you, Elisha asked. So what can I do? Elisha said, I'm a prophet. You know, preachers don't have money. Why are you coming to me? Then he said, tell me, what do you have in the house? Now, that's a good question right there. What's in your house? Because what's in your house may be a key to your destiny. If you have the wrong stuff in your house, it may be affecting you. Some people allow the wrong stuff in your house. But he was not just referring to that. He was referring to the fact that, you know what? There's something in your house that's going to bring a miracle to you. There is something that you have in your home. And here's really the key. There is an anointing in the house. He looked at the woman and he said, tell me, what do you got in your house? We always look for the miracle to come from outside. Boy, if I can go run after that prophet. Boy, if I can go run after that man of God. Boy, if I could go here and there and everywhere. If I could get a word of God from this one or that one. But he's saying, no, no, the miracle is already in the house. God's already given the provision for the need that is here. You don't have to go running after everybody else. You need to know that the miracle's already been provided. For God is a God of provision, and the provision is already in your house. Now, let me reference back. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 7? He said, If anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he didn't say that there's some external source to that, he said, Out of your belly. There's going to be a flow because I already placed it there. Because I already put it inside you. I already gave you the key of the provision for the need that you're going to have. You catching that? It just has to be poured out. It's already inside of you. It just has to flow. It just has to be released. Let's look at the rest of 2 Kings 4.2. He said, what can I do to help you? Tell me what do you have in the house? And here was her answer. Nothing. Nothing. I don't have anything at all. Imagine what her house looked like. She said, I don't have anything. I got nothing left. Apparently, she sold all the furniture. Apparently, she got rid of everything because she was trying to raise money to pay the debt. She said, I don't have anything. Now, I don't know about you. Jessica and I are working on this thing called downsizing right now. 
that ain't fun. I get caught up. We just we start going through an area, and we'll just open up a box, and I'll think, oh, what's in this box? And then I'm just sitting there crying. Oh. Well, I remember that. Oh. And we have to prioritize. What do we really need? Because I don't know about you. We got a whole lot of stuff that we don't really need. And sometimes the stuff that we are holding on to, we're not holding on to it. It's holding on to us. And you have to prioritize and determine, okay, what do I really need? I don't really need all this. Like I was telling so I really, I don't need three Sawzalls. I just got this one, then I got a backup, then I got an, I mean, what, all, what am I going to be doing with, I'm not, I'm not cutting a whole house down here. I got backups for my backups for my backups. And I think one by one, she went through and said, well, we could sell this. Well, we could sell that. Well, we could sell this. I think she probably had a yard sale. She probably went on Facebook Marketplace and started putting stuff. She went on Craigslist and said, well, let me see. And people were trying to bargain with her. And she's trying to figure out how much money she can raise. But she didn't have enough. She said, I don't have anything left. I've got nothing at all except a flask of oil. She had prioritized what was most important. I think she probably got rid of the duplicate stuff first. Then she probably went down and said, well, we probably really don't need this. Well, this is probably really extra. She got, she sold her television set. I'm sure it was beautiful. <laughs> My goodness, the woman sold her table chairs, her bed. Well, we can sleep on the floor. Me and my sons will be okay. And the only thing she had left was just this, this, this bottle of oil. When she kept going by, I, I think she probably kept looking at that and going, no, I can't part with that. No, that's, that's too precious. No, and she kept setting it aside. Maybe one of the boys had said, Mom, I think we'd get some money out of that oil. But she said, no, I'll get rid of my bed before I get rid of the oil. No, we, we get rid of the table, but we got to keep the oil. No, we can do without all this other stuff, but I'm going to keep the oil. I can't live without the oil. The oil is valuable. It, it apparently was the most precious thing that she and her sons had because they got rid of everything else. Let me tell you, don't get rid of the oil. Whatever else you got to get rid of, don't get rid of the oil. Don't get rid of the preciousness of what's in here. Other people might look at that and go, well, that, that's just a little bit of oil. That's not worth it. A whole, that's not worth that much. That's not the most precious thing. But to her, it was precious. You need to realize the preciousness of the oil in your life. You need to realize the, the incredible value of the anointing oil in your life. Mm. See, I'd rather have the oil of anointing than all the provision in the world. Rather have the oil of anointing than, than having the house and the car and the bank account and all the other stuff that the world can give. Because all that stuff, what's it worth? It's all going to be gone anyway. I need the anointing of the Lord more than anything. She valued that oil. So the prophet said, okay, you got oil? If you got oil, I can do a miracle. Just imagine, what if she said, I don't have anything? What if the answer was, I sold it? Maybe she sold the oil and got a temporary gain, but you can get a temporary gain and lose your soul. She said, I kept the oil. 
I got the oil. He said, well, we can work with that. And look at verse 3. He gave her an assignment. He said, go and borrow vessels from everywhere. From all your neighbors, empty vessels. Empty vessels. Do not gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons. This is just a a personal miracle I'm going to do in your house. It's for you and it's for your kids. And he said, then pour it into all those vessels. Go borrow vessels from everywhere for this? This, Now, if if I'm that widow, I'm looking at him going, you know, I don't think you understand. I didn't say I've got like some sort of reservoir over here. I got a little bottle. He said, you go and you, you just go to everybody you can go to. You just go start walking around. You just, Do you have a vessel I could borrow? Thank you, man. Empty vessel. Empty vessel. Wow. Yeah, maybe I could use that vessel right there. That's good. Go, go, go just, do you have a vessel? You can, oh, that's a unique vessel. Use that vessel. That's a nice vessel right there. Wow. Do you have a vessel? Oh, look at that. Wow. Look at that vessel. That's quite a vessel right there. Wow. Look at that one. That's, that's a good one. Start going around. Kenny, you got a vessel? Oh, wow, thank you. That's, that, wow, that, that's ready to go. Look at that. That's a, that's a nice vessel right there. Wow. Well, I need to get more vessels. I need to find vessels. You got a vessel I could use, Shante? Shante, you got a, oh, that's nice. That's a nice <laughs> vessel. A soda pop and a Stewart's orange right there. That's good. A vessel right over there. Who's got a vessel? Lynn, you got a vessel? Could I borrow? Oh, my goodness. Look at that vessel. Now that's a vessel right there. Look at that one. Babe, you got to help me. I, can, I need more vessels. We've got to fill this place up with vessels. you got a vessel. Thank you. Oh, look, man, that, is, that came all the way from Israel. That's a nice little vessel right there. We're going to put that vessel over here. I need to get a vessel. Oh, my wife's getting vessels. Who's got a vessel? Anybody have a vessel that we could use, that we could put the preciousness of anointing oil? Oh, thank you, Ange. Look at that vessel. That's a pretty vessel. Hey, how are you doing, Joy? You got a vessel? Oh, look at that. That's awesome. I love it. Thank you. We got some, some borrowed vessels. We got vessels that are big and vessels that are small. We got vessels that, are, that, that look like that they should have anointing oil. And some of them you look and go, I don't think that I would put anointing oil in that. But well, I can fill those with anointing oil. Oh, look at that. That's a beautiful little vessel. I can use that vessel for the Lord. I can, I can use that and put some anointing oil in there. We've got new vessels. We've got some old vessels. We've got some pretty vessels. And we got some ugly vessels. We got vessels that people might look at and go, yeah, that thing right there, that could be filled with anointing oil. And other people might look and go, no, no, I don't think that that vessel is really good enough for anointing oil to be poured into it. Some of the vessels are skinny. Some of the vessels might be a little heavier. Some of the vessels might be brand new. They might just be young. Some of them might be old. Some of the vessels might be
might be ones that look like the former thing that they used to have in them. But now there's going to be a fresh pouring of anointing oil. And that anointing oil is going to come in where they used to hold stuff of the world. They used to hold worldly things. Now they're going to be dedicated to the service of the Lord. Do you know what makes a vessel holy? A vessel is not made holy if you're a vessel for the Lord. I'm not made holy because I decided to clean myself up on the outside and look all nice and pretty like this. No, no, no. A vessel is made holy because he is on the inside. Hmm. Vessels that are dedicated to the use of the Lord. He said, go everywhere you can and just borrow vessels. And he, he was very specific to say, don't just get a few. More vessels and more vessels and more vessels and more vessels. Because this oil represents the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Oh man, I got another vessel coming. You look at this, and you look at all that, and you say, no, that, that won't work. That won't happen. You can't fill all that with this. No way. And even more vessels still coming. Vessel after vessel after vessel after vessel. I tell you what. God's got a supply for every single vessel. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 3. Then he said, go borrow the vessels from everywhere. That's what we did, right? Get a vessel from here, from there. Go to all your neighbors. Don't just gather a few. He said, when you've come in, shut the door behind you and your sons, pour it out into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. It was already the implication here. Now I look at this and I go, well, I, how many full ones could I even get? Just keep setting aside the full ones. Just keep asking people. Get every kind of vessel. Use them for the Lord. Here's the deal. You, like that woman, you get to determine the size of your blessing. Had she just went and got this vessel, and that was it, and come back in, she would have got this much blessing. But she said, no, I'm going to keep on going. I'm going to keep on. I'm going to keep on going and going and going. I wonder if she got tired in the going. I wonder if she went to some houses and said, could I borrow a vessel? And somebody said, no, no. No, I don't have anything. No, no, just get out of here. I wonder how many doors she had slammed in her face. I wonder how many times she thought, this is useless. Why do I have to do this? Why couldn't the prophet do this some other way? I wonder if she felt like this is just a hopeless errand that I'm on. I got an assignment, but now I don't even, maybe she didn't feel any anointing when she went to those houses. Some of you, you've been on assignment for the Lord, and you've gotten discouraged. And I'm talking to some people here. God called you, and he gave you an assignment in ministry, and you got just overwhelmed Maybe you felt like, I'm not contributing anything. This is hopeless. This is useless. I'm not capable of doing what God called me to do. Let me just tell you that God told me to come here today and tell you, keep on doing what he said to do. When it feels hopeless and useless and you're overwhelmed, when people don't respond the way they should respond, when you are struggling, just keep on doing what you know to do because because God will be faithful. 
she could have thrown her hands up and quit right in the middle. But she kept on. And verse 5, so she went in from him, and she shut the door behind her, her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured out. She walked in obedience. She walked in obedience when nobody was looking. It had been easy to give up when she was out walking through the villages trying to find vessels. And then when the door was closed, sometimes people are one thing when everybody looks at them, but when they get in their house and they close the door, there's something else. When the door was closed and she was in her house, she kept walking in obedience and saying, I'm trusting God with this. I'm going to do what God said. And she looked at her flask of oil, and I'm sure she thought that she knew how much oil she had. Some of you think you know how much oil of anointing you have. Some of you think you know the limits of what God could do through you. You think, well, God couldn't use me in that way. Oh, God couldn't do that through me. No, you don't understand. I'm a broken vessel. I'm leaky. I don't know if you're like me. Sometimes I leak. <laughs> We're all imperfect vessels. We're made holy by him who comes on the inside. That anointing of the Holy Ghost. Mm. And you think you know how God has used you so you know how he will use you. She can look at that and go, I don't know. I think there's about 14.3 ounces of anointing. That's how much I'm good for. And Elisha said, no, 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 no. You're not good for 14.3 ounces. You just go and you just get vessels and you just watch. Because when you start to pour out more, will miraculously come into your vessel. Mm. When you start to pour out, I'm going to give you more. Mm. Are you hearing me today? That leads to the title of my sermon for today. That's the introduction. Do you want more from the Lord? Pour for more. Pour for more. God, I want more. God, I want more. But if I'm over here saying, Lord, just fill my cup, and I just want to get it, and it's just going to be all mine, I'm not going to get the more that I'm wanting. The greatness is when I just pour it out. Pour it out. I just go share with everybody. I just go share with everybody. Marty Kreider will often text me. And he'll say, Pastor, you preach this. And I've been preaching that at my work all week. I've been telling everybody. Because what I pour into Marty, Marty takes it and pours it out, whether they want it or not. <laughs> he just goes finds borrowed vessels wherever he's. Hey, I just want to tell you, my pastor was preaching about this on this Sunday. And he'll text me about it. And now, even that Marty and Deborah are living in Florida, I get texts from Marty, and he'll be watching the service. I don't, he might be, they might be watching right now. He'll be watching the service and give me a word back of how God's using the word that God gave me through him. If it was poured into you, that's wonderful. That's great. Now, it's got to be poured out. Some of you got filled with the Holy Ghost last week. Has it been poured out yet? Because the pouring out makes room for the more to come in. Is that good? There is, you have access to a supernatural source. You have access to a supply that's beyond this world. You know, everybody's wringing their hands talking about, oh, we're going to have a recession. Oh, what's going to happen? And oh, what's the economy? Listen, the economy is not what provides for me. 
The president, he does not provide for me. Congress doesn't provide for me. The stock market doesn't provide for me. My God is able to supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There is an unending supply. This week, I was talking with Cindy Dixon, and she was just sharing with me. She said, you know, Pastor, years ago, I was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost for a long time. And she said, I I came to the opinion that it just wasn't for me. I knew that it was of God and it was for other people, but it just wasn't for me. And I had been praying and, and seeking the Lord for the baptism, but I hadn't got filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Didn't know what the reason was, and I thought, it's just not for me. And she took me back in my mind to a time when the Holy Ghost had been moving greatly and in our youth ministry and, and then in the church. And we had been praying, Lord, we want more. We want more. We want more. We want more. And Pastor Jim and Judy Willett came to do revival for us for a few days. And that few days just kept stretching on one day at a time, another day, another day. Well, let's do let's, The Holy Ghost kept moving, so another week. And we, would, and we were meeting every night. We met every, and with six weeks, we just met every night at the church. And God, I mean, it was just powerful. And during that time, Cindy said, I wasn't seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I had come to the idea that it's not for me. And she said, one of the other ladies was up for prayer at the altar. And she said, I thought I need to go pray for her. And she said, I walked up there to pray for her. I, I got in back of her. And I stretched my hand out. And I took my hand and I put my hand on her. And I started to pray for her. But when I did, all of a sudden I was not praying in English. I started speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. She said, I got baptized in the Holy Ghost by praying over her. And when you told me that the other day, Cindy, it just confirmed what the Lord had already been speaking to me about this Sunday. That you were willing to pour out. You you went up there to minister to somebody else. But in the pouring out to others, God said, let me just pour more into you. Let me just give you more. Let me just pour more inside of you. Mm. Let me give you the last part of the story here in verse 6. Now it came to pass... When the vessels were all full, every vessel. Somebody said, are you going to fill them all, Pastor? No, just imagine they're they're all full. (laughs) That she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there's no other vessel. So the oil ceased. I don't want our church to ever get to that point. I see churches that don't have any borrowed vessels. And I don't want the oil to ever cease in our church. It's not God's will that the oil ceases. Verse 7, then she came and she told the man of God and he said, go and sell all the oil and you can pay your debt. And then you and your sons will live on the rest. This woman didn't have the amount of vessels I have because she went and sold it, paid off this huge debt that was going to put them into slavery, and then had enough money to live the rest of their lives. They were good. God's got unending supply for you too. Have you tapped into that yet? That is what the Holy Ghost does. Now here's what I want to tell you. You need to make a decision to pour for more. To pour out so that more can be poured in. Now, if you haven't received the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, we're going to pray for you in just a minute. 
Now, I, I would like you to, one, ask him to fill you. And then you have to yield because it's a key part of what happens in this process. It's different with different people, but the Lord will give you words. He's not just going to start speaking for you. He's going to give you a word. Sometimes it's just a syllable. And you have to be the one that speaks the word. Somebody say amen. He's the one that gives the utterance. You're the one that speaks it out. But here's what I'd challenge you. Before you come, would you commit to him that you're going to pour out whatever you have? It's precious. It came from him. If God called you to it, then you need to say, I'm going to be used in that. I'm not going to have this, this mindset of just getting by, of a little bit of just fill my cup, of it's about me. No, I'm not going to have that. I'm going to pour out. God, you can use me whatever way. I'll be a vessel for you. You pour in, and I'll just pour it out. God, you give me divine appointment, and I'll minister to people. I'll find people anywhere I go. And then I want to talk about one other pouring out. When you come to him this morning, you need to come to him to pour out your praise lavishly on him. You need to come to worship him. Come on, guys. Would you give me something there? Yeah. Pour out your praise lavishly on him. Sometimes people come for the baptism of the Holy Ghost and they don't know what to do, so they're just in silence. Pour out, 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 pour out your praise. Speak out praise to him. Begin to let that flow from the innermost being. Hallelujah. I need intercessors to come up here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I need the prayer warriors to come. Would you stand this morning? Holy Ghost, we are desiring. more and more and more and more and more of you. Yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. God, we want to pour out our praise. We don't want to hold back our praise. And God, whatever you pour into us, it will be used in the kingdom because we'll keep pouring it out and pouring it out and pouring it out and pouring it out. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, as these are here to pray, if you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost, I want you to be the first ones up here. If you're saying, I want the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance, then come on down here right now. Come on down here right now. Maybe you need a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost today. Maybe you've, you've had the Holy Ghost do a work in your life before, but you need a fresh touch. I want you to come down here right now. Let's flood the altar. Let's fill the altar. And maybe you need a healing. Maybe you need a special touch from the Lord. Don't let the enemy convince you to sit back. You need to come now. Hallelujah. Yes, God. Lord, I pray that the anointing of your Holy Ghost would fall in this house afresh and anew.